Two months ago, I studied coral disease as part of a remote externship through Paragon One in partnership with National Geographic and the Nature Conservancy. I interviewed three researchers about their work regarding coral disease, Brian Grady, John Burns, and Ashley Pugh. My goal was to learn what conditions affect corals in Hawaii, what research is being done to study coral disease in Hawaii, how does this research influence management strategies, what are the most significant challenges for coral research and conservation. First, a little background information. Around 80 species of coral inhabit the Hawaiian archipelago. Parietes, Pasilopora, and Montipora are the most abundant genre. These corals belong to an order of cnidarians called Sloractinia. Sloractinian corals, often referred to as hermatypic corals, are the primary builders of shallow water coral reefs. Like all animals, corals are susceptible to disease. Diseases are characterized by specific lesions on the colony caused by a pathogen or parasite. For example, we know this coral has a condition called parietes trematodiasis because of the multifocal pink lesions on the colony surface. This condition is caused by parasitic larval trematodes. Some conditions may look like a disease or infection, but are actually normal biological interactions, such as these blenny bites on the surface of this lobe coral. Disease can spread to other colonies through water currents or interactions with fish. Factors such as host abundance, environmental stressors, and pathogen virulence and abundance can influence the likelihood of an outbreak. Outbreaks are known to cause extensive coral mortality which can harm fisheries, coastal protection, and tourism due to the loss of live coral cover. Ashley Pugh is one of the co-coordinators for Eyes of the Reef on Hawaii Island. Eyes of the Reef is a community network to report anomalies such as disease, bleaching, and invasive species. It's the first level of Hawaii's Rapid Response Contingency Plan, which was created in 2008 to investigate and mitigate outbreaks. Ashley's role in Eyes of the Reef involves conducting outreach and responding to community reports. I did an interview with Ashley via email. She wrote, Fortunately, West Hawaii has not been hit by widespread coral disease like black band disease or stony coral tissue loss disease like ecosystems in the Caribbean. Conditions that we commonly observe affecting the health of corals in West Hawaii include heat-driven bleaching, trematodiasis infestations, and general unspecified diseases or infections that cause a colony to display a pigmentation response, usually a vibrant pink color. To find out what research is being done on coral disease in Hawaii, I interviewed Bryant Grady and John Burns. Bryant is a graduate student with Arizona State University's Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science. For the past two years, he has focused his research on coral disease spatial ecology. I decided to ask him what type of research the center does. There's a, a lot of different branches that work with coral disease directly as well as work around the idea of coral disease and coral health conditions. So most directly is our South Kona initiative project that we're doing right now. I'm leading the project right now that focuses on where coral disease occurs in the South Kona region, the severity of where it occurs, uh, and how the spatial patterning of disease spreads and moves throughout that region. In addition to that, we've had several projects with the center that have done work in the Caribbean that look at coral outplanting, uh, coral disease in the region, and then ways to monitor uh, disease outbreaks from uh, things like airborne spectroscopy as well as satellite-based spectroscopy. John Burns is an assistant professor at UH Hilo in marine and data science. He developed the Mega Lab, which uses innovative tools to study coral reef ecosystems. I decided to ask him how these tools help them study coral disease. Right now we do a lot of three-dimensional mapping of reefs. And so then we use repeated surveys in similar locations to track how things like disease and bleaching or even physical disturbance alters the reef. When I say alters the reef, I mean, how does it change the community composition? So we might have had 50 corals, now we have 30. We might have had seven species and now we have five. Once that change happens, then what does it mean for the reef architecture, right? So it's similar to a city where you lose a few buildings, like you demolish them, they get knocked down. Now you have a different carrying capacity, right? You have a different number of people you can support because you've lost apartments and you've lost, you know, resources. And so the reef is very similar. Like each coral is, is home and habitat to various organisms. So we look at how, as the disease, one, how fast the disease progress, two, if they cause mortality of coral, what does that mean for the whole community? 
My third question for Bryant and John is how they think their research influences coral reef management strategies, such as mitigating and preparing for outbreaks. Uh, one of the big thoughts on research in the next decade is going to be, is Hawaii going to turn into something like Florida and uh, the Caribbean, where we see these really large outbreaks of diseases of the dominant force of reef decline there. And there are a lot of new studies that are going to target and prepare for this eventuality that people are thinking is going to happen in the next decade or two decades. So finding where we can map coral disease at such a large scale, prepping these different types of studies, uh, and working directly with state governments uh, such as DAR and DLNR to prep for these eventualities. How can we focus on the prevention as well as when it does come, how can we manage these outbreaks? Yeah, I mean, so we've been on the forefront of integrating a lot of these different tools like 3D mapping and molecular profiling and so forth. And so it has directly influenced management in the sense that we get a lot of grants from federal agencies to come in and change their management strategies so that they're using more high resolution mapping tools and then taking the resulting data and being able to prioritize places or specific attributes that promote reef resilience. My final question for all three researchers is what they think are the most significant challenges for coral research and conservation. Ashley wrote, many coral diseases are understudied and require laboratory analysis for identification. Oftentimes corals will display a visible stress pigmentation response, making it clear that they are fighting something, but to confirm the disease caused as virus, bacteria, ciliates, or something else often requires analysis in a lab. When a densely occurring disease does present itself, preventing disease spread is another challenge. It's difficult to create barriers to prevent the spread from diseased colonies to others because water circulation and flow through the reef can be a vector for disease spread. If the disease is identified early enough, strategies to remove or mask diseased portions of the colonies can be used to stop further spread. I think one of the biggest things that's a challenge for uh, not just coral disease but a lot of conservation and research in Hawaii is uh, interagency cooperation and communication. Uh, lots of different agencies, NOAA, DLNR, ASU, they do a pretty significant amount of talking, but there's not a huge amount of collaboration and coordination on these fronts. So that's always a challenge in science. In coral disease, a lot of the times coral disease is thought of as the secondhand issue where coral bleaching gets a lot of attention and a lot of funding. Coral disease is usually uh, if there's funding left. Uh, I will just say two things. One, global problems that take collective efforts to deal with. So things like climate change, rising temperatures, global pollution, you know, those are not like issues that we can fix in our backyard. So there's a lot you can do in your backyard to promote healthy reefs, right? Minimize your waste stream, minimize your carbon output, so forth. Those are all positives. They do a great thing. For global problems, though, we need a global response. That's difficult. The other thing that's difficult is for humans to accept that we're not the greatest thing on the planet and that we don't have all the answers. More often than not, especially in the last few years, there's a heavy push for like restoration activities. You know, and the, the term they use is boots on the ground, meaning like we want to, you know, we want to get involved. People need to do something. And so what we might need more of, which is harder to do because it doesn't involve us, is just simple preservation, meaning leave some of these places alone. Don't go in there and try and fix them. Don't go in there and try and implement, you know, out planting and regrowth and, and adjustments. Just leave them. Just leave them be. Don't let anyone go there. No tourism, no fishing, no nothing. And one thing we've noticed in a lot of reefs that are isolated that we work at is when left alone, they tend to go down the path of recovery. Now that you know what coral disease is, what research is being done, and the management challenges, what can you do to help? If you live in Hawaii, you can get involved by joining Eyes of the Reef. All you need to do is visit the website, complete the online training modules, then contact your local island coordinator for free materials. Another way you could help out is by spreading awareness and learning more about coral disease. There's a lot of information on the Eyes of the Reef website, including information about identifying corals and coral disease. If you enjoy watching documentaries, I recommend watching Chasing Coral and Lost Cities, which provide a lot of information on corals and other challenges in the field. 
I will provide links to both documentaries and other useful websites in the description of this video. Special thanks to Bryant, John, and Ashley for the help with this project and to the people at Paragon 1, National Geographic, and the Nature Conservancy for making this externship possible. I highly recommend applying to this remote externship if you're a student interested in issues regarding marine conservation. It's a great way to network with other students and researchers from around the world. The link to the application will be in the description of this video. Thanks for watching.